This is episode number 182 with Patrick McEwen. New concepts and ideas to help you reach your full potential. Reach your full potential. Reach your full potential. Small win, small win, small win. Keep your momentum going. The Success 101 Podcast. Welcome to the Success 101 Podcast. This is your host, Jared Warren. At each episode, my goal is to bring you a new concept or idea to help you maximize your full potential. Thanks for joining me here today. Now let's kick things off. Hey guys, welcome back to the Success 101 Podcast. So glad you came back here to join me again for part two of my incredible episode with Patrick McEwen, author of The Oxygen Advantage and who shared so much with us on the last episode. If you didn't hear part one of why improper breathing is sabotaging your performance, Turn this podcast off right now. Head over to iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or my website. You owe it to yourself to listen to part one. We're going to dive into a ton of goodness here today, and I would caption this episode as more of a performance episode. We talked a lot last time about the benefits of breathing through the nose, and though we will tackle that here again today, you're going to hear about more performance-related measures when it comes to breathing and why that is so crucial in addition to the everyday breathing techniques we should be following for health, performance, and everyday living to be more optimal as you all reach for higher levels of peak performance. Before we get started, I wanted to remind you guys all that my team still has my book available here in the U.S. for just the shipping cost. Head to success101podcast.com forward slash book where you can get your hands on From Success to Significance. Learn about the six vision building strategies the five components for creating your vision, and get ready to end 2017 on a phenomenal note while you get ready to kick off 2018 and reach for higher levels of maximum potential and purpose. We've sent out hundreds of these books since my team made it available for just the shipping costs, and I can't wait for you to get the paperback in your hands as well to work through these vision building exercises. For those of you guys who aren't in the U.S. or you want the ebook reader version, Go to the same address, success101podcast.com forward slash book, but choose the ebook reader as the option. And if you want it for just the shipping costs on that paperback version, for those of you in the U.S., I forgot to mention, please put success101 in the promo code or coupon code at checkout. You'll get that discount and get it for just the shipping cost. I think the ebook reader's a couple bucks more for you guys to have that. So either way, go get it in your hands. You'll be happy you did. Also, I wanted to mention that my coaching programs have been finally released, and it's so fulfilling after working on these for so long to see the response you guys have given, the comments that have come in. Those of you who are already going through the coaching modules, how much life change and performance change has been happening, and I would encourage you guys to at least go check out the options that are there. My team and I have made coaching programs that should suit any need you have through the consulting systems programs we've put over there. And all you have to do is head to success101podcast.com forward slash coaching to be able to choose through one of the four transformational modules we've put out there. There on that page, you'll see the transformational life change module, the ultimate personal planning and development module, which has been the most popular for people so far, with the eight individual sessions where we go through a customized culture index and career profile report, We discover your unique ability in aligning your passions with your greater purpose in life. Real-time measurements, and these are ongoing reporting measurements toward your progress in very key performance areas that we'll be breaking down together. Leadership and personal development specifically designed to your personality and mental style patterns. Mental is a big part of these coaching programs and how we can thrive every day, not only in the work that we're doing, but reframing our mindset. The third module is the six-week blueprint creation, where we get super focused around in-depth coaching strategies toward a specific area of focus that you're concerned with. This is probably my favorite one because it gets so deep on certain measurements to really help you grow. And then finally, the monthly progressive and development module. All of these can be offered as individual sessions or corporate sessions as a group. So again, head to success101podcast.com forward slash coaching to go see the options there and how my team has put this together. I'm so excited for you to check this out and cannot wait to have you in the course. Now, on to our incredible show today with Patrick McHugh. And again, this is part two of a two-part series where we're going to break down a ton of performance-based measurements today when it comes to breathing proper breathing, breathing techniques, why breathing the right way is so important for peak performance and optimizing your life, 
And if you love part one, I think you're going to enjoy this episode even more because of the breakdown we go through in an in-depth way, maybe a little more than we did in part one, as you're going to see here in just a second. So let's dive right in and not wait a second longer. Without any further delay, let's cut right to my conversation in part two with the one and only Patrick McEwen. Patrick, welcome back to the Success 101 podcast. So fortunate to have you back here. And for those who have not heard our part one episode at the time you're hearing this, please do me a huge favor, push pause and go back and listen. You owe it to yourself. You owe it to everyone around you that is looking for peak performance to be able to get this information out to them of what we visited about last time, what we're no doubt going to talk about today. Just everything from brain fog to overall allergies to energy levels, peak performance, Push pause now. Go back and listen to that episode. And we're going to dive on in here to part two. Glad to have you back. It sounds like the uh, weather's a little bit better. No storms going on right now. And uh, and I'm sure our audio is going to be a little bit better today. So, Patrick, we talked a lot about nitric oxide last time. You mentioned nitric oxide is produced by other areas of the body as well. But the nose is a great source of that. And when we're utilizing it properly, I think the question might be, how does our nose, which most people don't have a lot of education about the sinus cavity and those sort of things that go, you know, deep into our head. How is the nose a reservoir for nitric oxide when we're really trying to build up that great benefit that you discussed last time? Sure. I think like overall, even though the benefits of nitric oxide have been discovered for, you know, 20, 30 years, um, there's still more stuff to be discovered about it. Originally, it was thought that the the paranasal sinuses, um, which surround the nasal cavity, that nitric oxide is, is released from the sinuses into the nasal cavity. Now it's being taught as well that while the sinuses can play a role in producing nitric oxide, that the nose itself may be also producing nitric oxide. So it's not exactly known, but it is known that the nose, the nasal cavity, um, is a very good source of nitric oxide. And nitric oxide then that's carried as part of the breath into the lungs. And nitric oxide also is a signaling molecule in terms of sending signals down to the lungs, but also um, playing a role in upper airway dilation. And basically that's in, in the upper airways, staying open during sleep, for instance, which will be involved in obstructive sleep apnea. The gas itself, it's a wonderful gas. In 1992, it was, it was you know, known as a mighty molecule. Researchers said it was one of the, ma- one of the, the only gases that actually just united all the major disciplines of medicine. So in terms of the nose, the nitric oxide emanating from the nose that's carried into the lungs with each breath, a couple of things there to influence it. If you breathe fast, you're going to take a lighter concentration of nitric oxide into the lungs. Whereas if you breathe nice and gently and slow, you'll take a higher concentration of nitric oxide into the lungs. And in the lungs, nitric oxide performs a role with ventilation perfusion. So basically it brings the blood from the lower lobes of the lungs to the upper. And nasal breathing brings the air from the upper lobes of the lungs to the lower. So you get a better ventilation perfusion taking place. Slow breathing is key there. And slow breathing is key also to allow oxygen transfer to take place from the lungs into the blood. So breathing through the nose and breathing slowly improves oxygen uptake. And it also improves end tidal CO2. And basically that means that oxygen delivery from the blood to the cells can be increased. Another benefit to nose breathing then is is nitric oxide as a bronchodilator. So basically it helps open up the airways and that's very important for people with asthma. It sterilizes the incoming air. Now, the shelf life or the gas life of nitric oxide is not very long, but research has estimated it's between 2 and 30 seconds. So it, is, it could be plausible that nitric oxide coming from the lungs will actually enter into the blood and do its work in the blood vessels because in the blood vessels, nitric oxide, it can help to reverse the buildup of plaque. It can help the, to reverse the buildup of cholesterol. And it's also a vasodilator. It helps to open up the blood vessels. And we don't know that the necessarily the connection, but we've often found that, for instance, men uh, who mouth that they're more prone to erectile dysfunction. So basically breathing through the nose. Now, it could be the benefit of breathing through the nose during sleep. And as a result, then it reduces erectile dysfunction. And it has been known that men with nasal polyps, nasal polyps are basically inflammation in the nose, which would cause these men to mouth um, that they were more prone to erectile dysfunction. So whether it was due to nitric oxide, because nitric oxide is the gas that's a vasodilator, Viagra is based, for example, on nitric oxide. Uh, so I think it's, it's worth mentioning, you know, because it is an issue that can affect men and nose breathing is going to be key there. I can promise you every man that was listening to this podcast, whenever you <laughs> mentioned that, immediately closed their mouth, whether they had it open or not, or whether they knew about that or not, they immediately closed their mouth. That's fascinating. So 
nitric oxide, I mean, we, again, we talked a lot about it last time and thanks so much for clarifying that. Let's shift gears for a moment to the other, you know, you could, I think I even made the comment in the last episode. I can't remember, but I think I said, maybe we've been lied about to nitric oxide for a long time. I know that it was considered a poisonous gas that no one thought could help outside the body, you know, years ago. And then now it's such a helpful benefit. Another thing that we may have been misled on for so long, and this really gets to the crux of your work and the benefit here is carbon dioxide. You know, most people assume we want to breathe in deep bouts of oxygen, as we mentioned last Last time we want to saturate those tissues with, with oxygen and we want to expel quickly all the carbon dioxide because that's bad you know that's bad for you as most people would say tell me why we've been presumably lied about that for our entire life and why it's actually getting the oxygen to the points that it needs to go for peak performance that carbon dioxide is so essential for doing that and we're just not tuned into it like we should be yeah sure just with nitric oxide as well it can be a marker of inflammation so if there's inflammation present nitric oxide can be generated. And it's thought that gener the generation of nitric oxide is there to try and quell or counteract the inflammation. So high levels of nitric, high levels of NO on the exhaled breath of asthmatics can be a marker for inflammation. So just, I think it's not completely understood even about nitric oxide. Even today, you know, when I'm re reading papers that are written quite recently, more so with obstructive sleep apnea, is obstructive sleep apnea the failure to implement nitric oxide or mouth breathing or bypassing the nose. So you're not carrying that nitric oxide into the airways. And as a result, the airways aren't working the way they should do. There's more to be discovered, but highly fascinating gas. And I think very important for human health. Carbon dioxide and oxygen. How many times do we hear it? Take in that deep breath, bring in as much oxygen into your lungs and breathe out as hard as you can to get rid of toxins from the lungs. We often associate right. the human right. body is like a fire. And a fire consumes oxygen and gives off carbon dioxide. So as human beings then, well, it, people often say then is we're consuming oxygen and we're giving off carbon dioxide. But it's, a, it's really ironic because in order for oxygen to be released from the red blood cells to the cells, we need carbon dioxide. So when oxygen passes from the, blood, from the lungs into the blood, it's relatively insoluble in the blood. So only a small amount of oxygen is carried directly in the blood. There's three milliliters of oxygen for every one, one liter of blood. So very little oxygen is dissolved directly in the blood. Most oxygen is carried in the blood by hemoglobin molecules. And hemoglobin is an, a protein with an iron ion at its core. And basically it allows up to 70 times more oxygen to be carried than what otherwise would be. So you can imagine that the carrier of oxygen in the blood vessels is hemoglobin. But how do you get hemoglobin to release oxygen to the cells where it's needed? And carbon dioxide is the molecule that's necessary to cause the release of carbon dioxide. Increased body temperature as well. There's another this phosphoglycerate too. But of that, carbon dioxide is essential. So if we're breathing too hard, we're, we're getting rid of too much carbon dioxide from the lungs. And as a result, because of diffusion, we're going to lower carbon dioxide in the blood. And if we lower carbon dioxide in the blood, well, the bond between hemoglobin and, and oxygen is going to, to increase. So the affinity of the hemoglobin for oxygen increases. So the harder you breed, the more air you breed, the more you get rid of carbon dioxide. And the loss of carbon dioxide causes red blood cells to hold on to oxygen. So the more air you breed, the less oxygen that's delivered to the cells. And you can easily put this into practice. Take 15, 20 big breaths in and out of your mouth, or even more, take 30 big breaths in and out of your mouth. And by the way, that hyperventilation provocation, it wouldn't be safe for all people. Um, especially for people with, say, cardiovascular issues, because if you breathe hard, not only does the bond between hemoglobin and, and oxygen increase, but also smooth muscle that's surrounding your blood vessels constricts. So the harder you breathe, the more your blood vessels constrict. So people say with cardiovascular issues, if they're breathing hard, there's reduced blood flow to the heart. The heart is not just the muscle to pump blood throughout the body. The heart also needs its own blood flow and its own oxygen supply. So breathing hard is reducing oxygen delivery, while at the same time, it's increasing oxygen demand. So the heart has to work harder, but getting less oxygen. So anybody, you know, most people, if they take 15, 20 or 30 big breaths, they'll feel lightheaded. Well, if you're feeling lightheaded, it's not a sign that there's more oxygen getting delivered. It's a sign that there's less. So the more air you breathe, the less oxygen that gets delivered. So you mentioned hyperventilation a couple of times in there, and I saved this question to this part two. And really, I've been really eager to ask you about this. Before I knew about your work, I had followed several people out there who advocate box breathing, several people who advocate the Wim Hof method. And on some other work that I've seen you do, you have said that 
that's fine. Some, you know, you just mentioned there might be some danger to that. Some people can't do the hyperventilation, whatever, but it's fine if you're doing that for a few minutes during the day. But what are you doing for the other 23 and a half hours or so, you know, during the day? Tell me how people going out there following, and we're not, you know, we're not calling out Wim Hof here. We're not saying his method's bad. Please don't hear me say that. Anybody who's listening to this, that is not what we're saying at all. There have been proven benefits to that system as well. But just tell me how your system differentiates itself from this, uh, this kind of craze of, of Wilm Hoff over the last few years where people are saying this hyperventilation and doing push-ups while holding your breath, uh, breath in, by the way, not breath out as the oxygen advantage teaches us to do. How is that so much different? And really, is there a reason we should or should not be following that system versus yours? How do we incorporate maybe both into our lives? What is the big difference? I know our listeners are going to want to know. Sure. There's two aspects to what I look at. When, when somebody comes into me, I'm concerned about how, do, how does this person breathe 24-7? Uh, how do they breathe during their sleep? Do they breathe hard or do they breathe light? And how do they breathe during the day? And we have a measurement called BOLT. And I, I know we spoke about this. And basically, that's the measurement of how long can you hold your breath for after an exhalation until you feel the first involuntary movement of your breathing muscles to breathe. Or quite simply, take a small breath into your nose, small breath out to your nose, pinch your nose, and how many seconds does it take until you feel the first reaction of your body to take a breath? And your breath should be fairly calm at the end of it. The lower your bowl score, the harder you breathe. The harder you breathe, the more likely to, you're, you are to have the mouth open. Um, you probably sleep with your mouth open. You have your mouth open during your night and then you wake up very tired in the morning. Your mouth is dry, it affects dental health, bad breath, etc. It affects your state of calmness. Also breathlessness. If you've got a low bowl score, you're more likely to be more breathless during physical exercise. So if you think of somebody who's walking down the sidewalk and they're carrying a suitcase and they're really huffing and puffing, they're out of breath. Now they're only walking, but they're huffing and puffing. So that person you'd say is, okay, number one is they're not in their ideal state of health. Now, if you were to put that person sitting down for about 10 minutes and then just measure their breath the whole time, you'll see that it will be low. So people who get breathless easy have a low breath the whole time. And conversely, people with a low breath the whole time get breathless easy. My concern is changing their everyday breathing pattern. Change it from being fast, upper chest, mouth breathing, irregular breathing, to being through the nose, driven by the diaphragm, light, quiet, and effortless. And breathing sh during rest should always be effortless. When breathing is changed during every day, um, performance is increased. The overall individual feels so much better. They have more energy, better sleep, easier breathing during physical exercise, and a calmer state of mind. And th those are influences that you can, inf you can change through your breathing. So even though breathing is an involuntary activity, we can literally change it 24-7. So when I'm teaching somebody breathing exercises, the intent is that the benefits of the breathing exercise that we're carrying it into their everyday breathing. I'm not just interested in just giving somebody a breathing exercise for three minutes or four minutes or five minutes, or whatever it is. I want their everyday breathing to change. And we can change everyday breathing with simple breathing exercise. The second aspect then is performance in terms of sports. I get every day breathing right in the athlete, improved oxygen delivery to the cells, better improved blood circulation. And then we challenge their body. We put them into breath holding. And when you do a strong breath hold and when you lower oxygen, blood oxygen saturation, it's a stress response in the body. So it activates what's called the sympathetic nervous system. And basically that in turn will increase pro-inflammatory um, cells. So it's very useful. It could be very useful for people with autoimmune conditions. In other words, that you're increasing pro-inflammatory cells to reduce inflammation that's associated with the autoimmune. And that's what's taken from the Wim Hof method. So Wim Hof method, the one thing that is very, very beneficial there is, is the breath holding and the effect it has. And when you read Cox's paper, it's remarkable, you know, what you can do to an immune system. And it's over the years, we would have seen people coming in with asthma, people coming in with chest infections, and they would report to us that their chest infections have substantially reduced and their asthma symptoms substantially reduced. And even with children, we see a significant improvement to both their sleep and also to their asthma scores, their the forced expiratory volume, their forced vital capacity. Uh, the children miss less school. And we can teach these exercises to kids. So two aspects to it is look at everyday breathing. How do you breathe every day? Let's change that. And also there are breathing exercises that you can do in terms of breath holding to stimulate the body, to challenge the body and to cause the body to make adaptations. And by the body making adaptations, including improving buffering capacity for, for example, delay of lactic acid and fatigue in athletes. There's also a psychological preparedness to it because 
we can, with breath holding on the exhalation, we create a greater hypercaplic. So we increase carbon dioxide to certainly above 50 millimeter of mercury pressure from, from 40, but we also lower blood oxygen saturation. And I can re- replicate this in pretty much any athlete, to be honest with you. And it takes, okay, some athletes I can do it there and then. Other athletes, it can take three or four days to do it. We can get athletes or we can get any individual, not just athletes, but generally if I'm doing strong breath holding, the person has to be relatively healthy because it's a stress to the body and they have to be able for it. So when the individual is able for it, we have them do breath holding and we can simulate a height of between, say, four and 5,000 meters or between 12 to 16,000 feet. You know, that's causing adaptations that when the athlete then is doing sports performance can give them that edge. So the Wim Hof method, which is involving 30 big breaths in and out of the mouth, followed by a long breath hold, followed by another cycle of big breathing, followed by a breath hold, followed by another cycle of big breathing or over breathing, and followed by another breath hold. Yeah, it's very, it's brilliant in terms of um, challenging the body and that immune response. Now, the one thing that I would say is anybody who's practicing the Wim Hof method, it, this is not the way to breathe all day, every day. It's fine for a short term because if you breathe more than what your body requires over 24 hours, you're going to be, you begin to develop the habit of over-breathing. And the harder you breathe and the more air you breathe, the less oxygen that gets delivered to your cells. So when you breathe hard and you get rid of carbon dioxide, there's a curve called the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. That curve shifts to the left. And basically it means that the bond between oxygen and the red blood cell strengthens. So I think anybody who is practicing the Wim Hof method, I think they really need to understand the basic physiology of breathing, that it's fine for short term, but for the rest of the day, adopt light breathing and especially through the nose and any other breathing modality. You know, you see it in yoga, you see it in Pilates. And I often ask people like, if you're, if you're in a yoga studio, you're practicing your yoga, can you hear people taking intentionally taking deep breaths or intentionally increasing the amount of air they take into their lungs? They say, yeah, we can. I say, it just doesn't make sense, you know. You're doing light postures. Yes, they can be a little bit demanding, but don't intentionally increase your breathing because if anything, you should be gently softening and slowing down the breath because then your yoga, you're going to have an added advantage of changing your everyday breathing pattern. The key to changing everyday breathing is to soften and slow down your breath sufficiently so that you have air hunger because the air hunger signifies that carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood and air hunger is the strongest stimulus to breathe. It is the stimulus to breathe. So by exposing your blood to a higher accumulation of carbon dioxide, you're able to reset the breathing center in the brain towards a higher set point of carbon dioxide. And as a result, then your everyday breathing becomes lighter. So in terms of breathing exercises, is it long-term, is it short-term? I think the best thing to do is to give people the tools to change their everyday breathing patterns. You'll improve their sleep, you'll improve their performance, and you'll improve for instance, asthma and mental health. And I know in your book, you also talk about part of your regimen that you use with your athletes is 10 to 15 minutes before performance in order to make them perform better. You do the uh, the nose unblocking exercise, which if you want to expand on that a little bit, that'd be great. But then also you do have a period of hyperventilation, uh, maybe similar, maybe a little different to Wim Hof method that you actually use to get them back into a uh, reset their system. So you're actually using a little bit of both, but I love the way you put that. It's basically how are you breathing all throughout the day and then doing these short bursts maybe is okay, maybe not. I would say for people, and this is just my take on it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say unless you've gotten to a point where you're consistently breathing through your nose, keeping your mouth closed during the day and training that muscle memory of your mouth to be closed, which I feel like mine's just now starting to do that, maybe staying away from all that overbreathing, even in short bursts, maybe that's a good idea until you, until you get that locked in. Would you agree? Well, the other thing is, you know, for, what's the difference between hyperventilating for, say, 30 breaths and then doing a breath hold? Um, the main difference was that with the Wim Hof method, you, cre- you create a hypocapnic, hypoxic response. So carbon dioxide levels do drop. And oxygen levels do drop. So the first cycle is, is during, in Cox's paper, the SpO2, which is uh, how fully loaded is the hemoglobin with oxygen, that drops to about 80%, which is a fairly significant drop. And the second cycle, then it drops to, I think it's about 70%. The third cycle, it drops to 50%. Whereas we do, you know, the breath hold, but without the hyperventilation, and we drop down to about 80%. We don't, want, we don't want people going to below 80% because they can get disoriented. So the question here to ask is, 
do you need to drop your SpO2 down to 50% to get the benefits? Because as long as you go below at 91%, you're stimulating that hypoxic response. So, you know, getting down to 80%, it should be sufficiently good as a stimulus to get the body to make adaptations, including improved immune um, functioning. So that could be worth exploring, but I don't know the full answer of it. In terms of preparing an athlete for a match, I generally recommend is, is do about 20 minutes of meditation. That's completely focus and calm the mind. Get rid of any distracting thoughts that are there. Um, bring the, the mind into complete present, into the present moment, and tap into that muscle memory in terms of keeping all of your attention completely in the now. And then after that, I have them do about six to 10 strong breath holds. And the strong breath holds is by creating a hypoxic response, the kidneys go hypoxic and the liver to a lesser extent, they synthesize a hormone called EPO or erythropoietin. And erythropoietin sends a message to the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. And it can happen pretty quickly. And the second thing that happens is that when you do a long breath hold, you've got a splenic contraction. So your spleen, which is located underneath the left side of the diaphragm, that's your blood bank. And that contains 8% of densely rich packed red blood cells. So when you hold your breath and do a strong breath hold, you increase your hemoglobin and the hematocrit. And your hemoglobin and hematocrit is your oxygen carrying capacity. So the whole purpose of it is do it 10 to 15 minutes before a game. Now, now the problem is, while the, you get benefits in terms of improved aerobic capacity, the problem is that your blood now is going to slightly acidic. And if you do your physical exercise and your blood is slightly acidic, you could have a slight disadvantage. So what I do then is I have the athlete spread over a minute, 30 breaths to say 30 seconds to one minute of harder breathing to get rid of carbon dioxide to bring the pH back down towards normal, or sorry, bring it up towards normal. So I want to get the benefits of breath holding, but I don't want to acidify the blood. So I also do the hyperventilation. To, to create a more alkaline environment. As a result, then when the athlete's going exercising, they're not going to be held back. So yeah, so it's kind of a combination. It's, you know, there's no trials as such doing breath tolling and also doing hyperventilation. There are a couple of trials looking at hyperventilation. More recently, the last couple of years, if you hyperventilate for between 30 seconds and one minute prior to physical exercise, it's been shown to improve sprinting and swimming, two sports that could be helped by it. But doing the breath tolling as well, you know, just a number of papers showing that, yes, it does synthesize EPO. And EPO is put in the map, really, because of the Tour de France. Cyclists understood the importance of it, you know, but you can, your body produces it naturally. By holding your breath, you can stimulate your body to do it. And that's how you get the edge. So talking about EPO, that's exactly the next direction that I was going to steer this. We know over here, especially in America, but, you know, around the world from the Tour de France, you know, Lance Armstrong, names like that, that have admitted coming out and admitting using EPO. And and guys, I, I can't stress enough to go get uh, the book because we're, we're only going to touch a small surface of this in the podcast, even on two episodes. But just so much more of your information dives into that. EPO is produced naturally, but it's released from the kidneys. And if I'm correct on this, it acts on the bone marrow to stimulate red blood cell production. And that improves the amount of oxygen in the body and that can carry to the muscles, those sort of things. So that's why you find people, especially Tour de France, they're doping with that. They're in the higher altitudes and they're using that to carry those red blood cells, improve oxygen, all of that. What specific exercise are you using specifically to target more or possibly more of the EPO production and carry us through that exercise maybe? Yeah, generally, if you, like if once you once you create a hypoxic effect, you you'll sometimes come across products or you'll come across devices or exercise, and they claim to simulate high altitude training. It's very easy to prove whether something simulates high altitude training by a pulse oximeter. If you buy a good brand such as Nonon, you can buy it on Amazon. They're not very expensive. Wear the pulse oximeter while you're doing your physical exercise, and you'll see normally you're between ninety five and ninety nine percent. Generally, in around ninety seven percent is normal. So when we're doing breath holding, the whole premise or the purpose of the breath hold is to drop below 91%. And when you're dropping below 91%, especially towards, you know, 80%, it means that that's a, that's a severe hypoxic environment. Now, not all studies show that hemoglobin will increase by doing breath holding. There are non-responders, and it's similar to doing high altitude training. There's non-responders from, from going up into high altitude. But the benefits of doing breath holding is not just from an aerobic capacity. The theory behind breath holding is 
And you could use any of the exercises. There's one exercise whereby you're walking, breathe in, breathe out, hold your breath, hold your breath for 10 paces, then resume breathing, breathe 10 normal breaths, uh, then hold again for 10 paces, resume breathing, then hold your breath for 15, then resume breathing for 10 normal breaths, 15, we increase it gently. There's another exercise there whereby you breathe in, breathe out, you hold your breath. And as the air shortage gets a bit stronger, you jog and you jog and you keep relaxing into your body. And as you're jogging, your cells are going to extract more oxygen. But of course, you've stopped breathing. So then your SpO2 is going to reduce. And then it's when you resume breathing, um, it's to minimize your breathing at the end of it because there is a delay be, you know, in the pulse transit time that it takes a while before you see the SpO2 lower on your oxygen pulse oximeter. And a pulse oximeter, it's only a small device that you place in your finger. There's a little infrared light in it. And the infrared light is detecting that if hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen, it gives off a different color. So it's able to tell you straight away how fully loaded are your red blood cells with oxygen. We have another exercise which I developed in that. I have an individual hold their breath for between, say, 40 paces and 60 paces, or if they're only starting off, say, 20 to 40 paces. And they hold their breath, they resume breathing but they take a sip of air and then they hold the breath again for between five and 10 paces. A sip of air, hold their breath again, sip of air. And here we can, this exercise is wonderful because we can create quite a hypoxic environment, but we can sustain it over a period of time. And describe for our listeners what what you consider a sip of air. I know you describe it in the book. Yeah, a sip of air is one tenth of a breath. And the purpose of taking a sip of air is just to give you some relaxation. It's not really to take, allow you to take more air in but it's just to relieve pressure of the diaphragm because it's not known exactly what terminates a breath hold. You know, when you're holding your breath, why do you have to resume breathing? But diaphragmatic fatigue could be a factor. So by taking a sip of air, you can kind of trick the diaphragm into thinking that you're taking air in, but you're not, you're only taking a small amount. You know, there's one paper, if I can remember correctly, it's a Canadian paper. It showed that if you lower your oxygen saturation below 91%, which is very easy to do, and if you do it for 24 seconds, you increase your EPO by 24%. And if you can do it for a minute and a half, you can increase it by 36%. And I have a simple exercise. I had my brother, just for fun of it, he's a triathlete. And in his sitting room, we had him on a turbo trainer with a pulse oximeter. And we said, yeah, here he is in his sitting room. So we made sure that it wasn't a gym, nothing fancy that anybody can do it. All he's doing is doing breath holding internally. And that's the advanced exercise from the book. And you'll see, you'll see straight away, he's dropping it down to 80%, 80%, back up, back down, back up, back down. And he's able to hold it in a hypoxic environment for that time. So it's a very novel way to do it. And again, like you'll see products made claims before to simulate altitude training. You can prove it yourself. If you're using a product, use your pulse oximeter and see, does it drop the SpO2? And the same with the exercise. I'm making a claim to simulate high altitude training. Well, use your pulse oximeter, give it a few days practice. And because some individuals can lower their SpO2 pretty quickly. And for others, you know, it takes a little bit of practice because it's the hypercapnic response. It's the, it's your ventilatory response to carbon dioxide determines how long you can hold your breath for. So if you can, if you can tolerate pretty high level of carbon dioxide, you're going to hold your breath for a longer period of time. And that's going to give you sufficient time for your SpO2, for your oxygen saturation to drop. So it can take you a few days to get to that point. But yeah, it's worth practicing. And I think you'll, you'll get a little bit of a buzz out of it. Yeah, I get really frustrated because I hear these claims. And I know I shouldn't because it's a work in progress. But I get frustrated when I hear you say things like take, you know, <laughs> take 20 paces, take 40 paces. Say, you know, I'm, I'm really poor at this, self-admittedly. I can, uh, my bolt score even, even to now because I just really haven't tried. The, it's such an uncomfortable feeling for me because it comes so quickly, that, that discomfort comes so quickly that unless I want to start gasping for air, which I know that you shouldn't do uh, for our listeners, it's if you have to, if you can't regain your normal breathing pattern within one breath, typically one or two breaths, maybe then you've held your breath for too long. But when you're holding your breath and whenever I plug my nose, whether I'm taking paces, you know, maybe it's eight paces for me, maybe it's 10 seconds for me, eight to 10 seconds for me is my bold score. And that's why I went to the doctor. I said in the first episode, I went to the doctor years ago saying I was gasping for air. I can't figure out what's wrong. He put the pulse oximeter on my finger and said, oh, you're fine. You got plenty of oxygen and there's a deeper issue. And so I'm trying to figure out why when I plug my nose, that burning in the chest starts coming up almost immediately and I can't hold it for very long. But No, it's it's normal response for some people. You know, it's, it really is coming back down to genetics. For instance, if I look at more on an extreme level, people prone to panic attacks, they've got a very short breath hold time. 
And if they hold their breath at all, they really feel panicked. You know, they feel that suffocation and they have an aversion to suffocation, but it's trainable. Um, so if an individual, if they hold their breath, if they really don't like the feeling, we go easy and just build it up over a period of time. But it, it's doable. We had touched a little bit last time when we ran out of time on the day I described uh, really wanting to master, kind of master this whole walking with paces, holding my breath. And so for about a 45 minute walk, I told just to, uh, walking my kids in the stroller to the grocery store. And I just continued to hold my breath, plug my nose for paces. On the way back, I started getting this overwhelming feeling of irritation, being edgy, being moody, uh, almost just um, not depressed, but like this depression coming over me where it was like, man, I just, I don't feel great right now. And I know it was my body responding to the stress that I was putting on it like it had never felt before. What do you really think, because we didn't have a chance to get into it so much last time, what do you really think was happening internally for me to start feeling those negative feelings? Uh, it's just like working out, right? I mean, if we really knew what we were doing, ripping our muscles apart, working out, we probably wouldn't want to work out. But the more we do it, the better it makes us, right? So I have to push through that. But what was happening initially to make me feel that moodiness and that depression coming on yeah. after doing that? I think it's just a stress response. It's it's difficult to know individual to individual, but you know, I don't know if I mentioned it last time. I've seen 18 and 20 year olds, and these would be footballers, and I have them do very minor breath tolling. And we have also 60 year olds in the room doing the same. And this is only gentle minor breath tolling. And I've seen them get totally panicked. Breath work like this, it can it can have an enormous impact, an enormous change. And that's why we work with it, you know, individually from person to person. And I think it's also good for people to start off easy and just gently build themselves to it. Now you were going for a walk. You might've been talking, I'm not sure, but you're already going for a walk. You're doing physical exercise and with a low bolt score, you're, you're going to be slightly breathless even just doing the walk. So you were adding breath holding onto already feeling breathless. And it might have been just a bit too much for you. So that would have been changing blood gases. And when you change blood gases, it can have, you know, a change psychologically, you feel it. We generally see with emotion, sorry, with females, they get a little bit emotional. And with males, they can get a little bit depressed. And that's normal. And it doesn't always happen. But again, and it may point back, you know, it just depends on our history and depends on family genetic traits. Right. And, and I guess just not, this is our disclaimer, right? We're not medical doctors, but I think for most people, just like with a workout, mm -hmm. pushing through that will only lead to improved results, I, I would assume, for most people. Yeah. And do it within limits. Like, I don't think there's any benefits from somebody, you know, when they're feeling that and they're really pushing, pushing. I'll always go easy enough with people. Now, I challenge them when I can, you know. So if somebody comes in to me and when they start off, I'll go easy enough. I want them to condition their body to the increased carbon dioxide. So we gently condition it because then we don't have any upsets and you don't have, you know, you're not going backwards, you know, so we can, we can build up and you can make monumental progress. With the bowl score, I'd expect about three to five seconds of an improvement each week, especially the first few weeks. Now it can take up to an hour of practice a day. So it could take say three by 20 minute sessions a day or six by 10 minute sessions. And that's doing the reduced breathing and, that's basically slowing down your breath to the point that you feel air hunger. And you feel air hunger, you're sustaining it, but you'll also feel increased watery saliva in the mouth, you'll feel warmer. Um, that's if you're doing it properly. Whereas if you feel very stressed, it means that the air hunger has gone too far. So it's a fine line between having no air hunger and too much of an air hunger. And that comes with practice. But here's the thing. You can directly change your physiology in minutes and bring your body from a sympathetic response into parasympathetic but you can also, with the other exercise, bring your body from parasympathetic into sympathetic. So when somebody is coming into a class and we're working with, with individuals, we're pushing them from parasympathetic, sympathetic, parasympathetic, sympathetic. So we're really kind of jolting around the autonomic nervous system. And that can be good because the body makes adaptations. And at the same time, we're resetting the breathing center towards a lighter breathing volume. It's all such great information. I know we're running out of time here. One of the things that I wanted to ask last time, and maybe I hinted at it and we didn't get a chance to cover it though, but just briefly, I know in the book, it alludes to the fact that if you feel the need to sigh, or even if you yeah. feel, I believe it said the need to yawn to suppress that, it's going to trigger those sensors in your body that, that, that just have that need or that seemingly that need for air. Is that pretty much the case in everyday life? If you're at work at your desk, or if you're commuting somewhere or doing whatever, when you feel a sigh coming on, you feel a yawn coming on, do everything you can to suppress that to where those sensors aren't triggered in your body. Is that correct? Well, what you could do is if you feel a sigh coming on, usually it's involuntary, the sigh is. Um, if you do feel it coming on, you could swallow or hold your breath, you know, to try and counteract it. Um, or if you miss the sigh, just hold your breath for about 10 seconds afterwards, just to compensate. As your bolt score comes up, 
your sign actually will decrease. And and that's always on the always on the out breath, right? It's always in the out breath. Um, so it. you can think of it one one big breath every seven minutes is enough to keep you stuck in chronic hyperventilation. So if you have an individual who is periodically sighing, not periodically, regularly sighing, and they're sighing quite frequently throughout the day, well, you know that their breathing isn't good. Um, sighing, I know researchers, a scientist about a year ago, they said sighing was an essential part for the brain, but no, periodic sigh is fine. But it's the people who exhibit frequent sighing, they have breathing pattern disorders. And that's what I want to address because I know as long as they continue to sigh and at the same time they're feeling tired, so they're yawning frequently, and with each yawn, they're taking in a massive big breath as well. So when we build up their bolt score, they don't feel that compulsion. They don't feel air hunger. You, you have a sigh when you feel air hunger, when you feel that you're not getting enough air. And ironically, the harder you breathe, the more likely you are to feel that you, you don't get enough air. So individuals who are coming into me, they explain, well, I just can't feel that. I just can't take that satisfying deep breath or I'm feeling that I'm not getting enough air. And this is their normal everyday breathing. So these people are breathing too much and their brain has become accustomed to the habit of breathing too much. And no matter how hard they breathe, or in actual fact, the more air they breathe, the less air they feel. You know, the more air they breathe, the more air they feel they need to breathe. So it's kind of a vicious circle. So suppressing the sigh, breathing through your nose, you know, and, and just working with it, keep breathing through your nose. The nose is an amazing organ. We have to consider this. The skin in a human being is about two meters in area. And the skin, most people will say that the skin is, is you know, the part of the body that has most contact with the atmosphere, where it's not really the skin that has most contact with the atmosphere. It's the lungs. The lungs are exposed to atmospheric air, just as the skin is. And the lungs occupy a space, an area of between 75 and 100 meters. So the area of contact of the lungs with the atmosphere is 50 times greater than that of the skin. And yet we don't breathe through the nose. We breathe through an open mouth. We're taking cold, dry, unconditioned air, which is laden with particles. And we're literally taking that straight into the, into the lungs. And the lungs are supposed to be able to deal. And given the, the area of space, like 100 square meters is, is the size pretty much bigger than a tennis court. And um, it's a huge area. And the lungs, that organ is there and equipped to be able to handle and condition that incoming air. Well, let's give it a hand breathing through the nose. And as long as you breathe through your nose, it starts working for you. And also, you know, there's been papers we've been looking at individuals who have nasal surgery. So they, this is, these are people who have a history of nasal complaints. Um, originally, they go to their drugstore, maybe when they're young, and they take antihistamines. And then they go to their general practitioner and our doctor prescribes them nasal steroids. So for years then, they're on nasal steroids, and then eventually they get fed up with this, and they go to their ENT, and he does an, an operation on the nose. They get the operation done on their nose, but they continue mouth breathing, because they've been mouth breathing for the previous 20 or 30 years. Now they get the operation, but they continue mouth breathing. And when they switch to nose breathing, they feel they're not getting enough air because of the bad breathing habit that they've picked up over the 20 years. So in order to make the success of the nasal operation, because I had an operation on my nose in 1994. Nobody told me to breathe through it. I continued breathing through, through an open mouth. So the nose operation was a complete waste of time. And with children, if children have an operation to remove adenoids and tonsils, and it's a dreadful operation. Yeah, it's, the benefit is better than the risk. Because if, if children have enlarged adenoids and tonsils, and if they can't restore nasal breathing, well, then they're at risk of obstructive sleep apnea. So you're better off actually having a tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy, than obstructive sleep apnea. But these kids have the tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, and nobody's teaching these kids to breathe through their noses afterwards. It's crazy stuff, because it's so simple, and it's so simple that it's overlooked, and I think it's time to go back to basics. And I think it's really time for the medical profession to give this a genuine and honest look, because there's something huge in this, and you could help many people. It's so amazing. Thanks so much for your work. And we wish you continued success as you're educating the world about this, including our children. You know, just think about our children and the generations to come is, you know, if you can put a man on the moon in 1969, mm -hmm. I've always said this for like so many things in my life. You can put a man on the moon in 1969 with no technology whatsoever. You would think that by 2017, we'd know more about breathing. And it's just, it's just ridiculous, right? I mean, there's a lot of things out there you <laughs> sure. think would have uh, evolved or we'd have more information about. So thanks so much for your efforts on that. I know the best place to find you, as we mentioned last time, is theoxygenadvantage.com. 
just cannot stress enough, guys, if you want to change life. I mean, mm -hmm. this is this is just something that I'm just so passionate about because of the struggles that I've had with breathing. And, you know, even if you're not struggling, like my story, if you don't feel it, there still could be an extra added layer of chronic fatigue and stress and agitated, you know, whatever out there. So worth tapping into for higher levels of peak performance. So we didn't even get into VO2 max and bicarbonate of soda. So I encourage you guys to go on in and, uh, and check out the book because there's tons of information in there. So Patrick, thanks again for your work. We appreciate it and wish you the best as you continue to dive into this and teach us all how to be better. You're so welcome, Jared. Thank you. Guys, what an honor and privilege it was to have Patrick on the show for this two-part series. Hopefully you took away as much as I did from these last two episodes and your life has been changed by learning how to breathe better. I look forward to hearing your comments and thoughts about these episodes and what you're doing to impact your breathing as time goes forward. If you guys would like to connect directly with me, the best way to do that is to shoot my team an email at info at success101podcast.com. Or you can catch me in the world of social media over on our Facebook Success 101 Podcast community page on Instagram under the name at Success 101 Podcast or even over on Twitter under the name at Warren Jared. I'll catch you guys on the next awesome and dynamic episode of the Success 101 Podcast. Until then. Until then.